All right, we are now recording. Now we go to the current slide. We'll go from here. All right, and again, I uh, apologize uh, about the very short notice and then the confusion on Monday. Uh, I wish I had thought to begin with Dr. Bryant teaching the same class next door, <coughs> only his is calculus based. And most of the time, fall and spring term, we stack them anyway. Summer, we have enough students we can do them separately. Uh, so it would not have hurt anybody to have gone. In fact, uh, I hope you did. Those who did go, what did y'all talk about? Were you about the same place? Or? What's that? Okay, so have y'all already done this kind of stuff? Okay. Um, and this is Essex. Second. Bradford, okay. I'm sorry, my hearing is so bad here, all right? Okay. Um, but so far, only one of you, no, two of you were here and heard Dr. Bryant's lecture. Uh, well, y'all get counted as present, the rest will not, but do you need to go over this again or move on past this? Well, I'll try to go over it quickly, okay? Because I don't know exactly where he left off and I haven't had a chance to interact with him because he came in while I was teaching my Cal 2 class and then by the time I finished that, he already started his physics class so I didn't get a chance to compare notes except to see that he did have a role to and I'll pick that up probably tomorrow, okay? <clears throat> All right, but just to, sorry that I missed I think I explained to you they had uh, had a solicitation for teams to come. I said, well, look, I wouldn't mind participating if we can do a Friday, Saturday in Atlanta. Uh, close, you know, we can handle that. I, I won't miss any classes. And I came back, well, we're going to request the one in New Orleans. I said, well, that's a Monday and Tuesday. I'll miss classes. Well, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. They didn't care. Well, we may get the, the Friday, Saturday in only because we're closer to that. Well, then all of a sudden they got Monday, Tuesday of this week, so I had very little notice. And it was it was awful trying to get everything done in time to do. And I, I missed some things like sending out the first email when I should have sent out the second one and not done the first. But anyway. Uh, what we were going to do last time, which we're going to do today, is have only from now until till 3.30, uh, have class on Chapter 3, Topic 3, and then from 3.30 to 5.30, we'll have the lab. It will not take you, I do not believe it will take you nearly that long to do the lab, so you'll probably get to go a little early today. Sorry you didn't have class Monday, you get to go early today. Pretty slack week, huh? I apologize, I know y'all are hating it. Okay, get over it. Okay, <clears throat> let's just go over this now. Once we hit areas that he didn't hit before, slow me down, okay? So, displacement. And we talked about this in the last chapter. The position of an object is described by its position vector r. Here's a position vector, there's a position vector. Anywhere that it may have been would be a position, posi position vector r. Position vector r is initiating from the origin and going to the position of the particle anywhere along its path. The displacement of the particle is defined as the change of position. Okay, change of position. So the delta R, which is the displacement, is R final minus R initial. Well, in this one, there's your R initial, there's your R final. What's the difference between those two vectors? R final subtract off R initial, which would be the same as adding a negative ri here and then what you have at the end would be this right here or better represented up there you're starting from this position going to that one. 
In other words, RI plus the change equal RF. That makes the most sense vector addition wise. So there is your delta R. Okay? Change of position. Does that make sense? You started here, you wound up there, there's your change of position from the first to the second. Okay? Now, what's the SI unit part? Position? Meters. In the lab we'll do today, we're going to measure it in centimeters. Everything works the same, it's just that's not SI unit. The displacement of the object is a vector delta R. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Taking this, that's your displacement, change of position. Your change of position per unit time. It took you some finite time to get from here to there. There's TI, TF. Okay? Some time to do it, so that change of position over the change of time, that's going to give you your average velocity. And that's exactly what is shown here. Average velocity, it is a vector. Velocities are vectors. It's defined to be change of position over change of time. Average. Okay, that's what AV is out here. Velocity is the ratio of the displacement, change of position, to the time interval over which that displacement occurred. Change of position over change of time. The instantaneous velocity has been the limit of this average velocity as this delta T gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, most of you, I take it, haven't had calculus, right? Haven't done derivatives. This is what a derivative is doing this. Don't sweat it. We're just going to deal with, with this part. The instantaneous velocity is the limit of the average velocity as delta t approaches zero. The direction of the instantaneous velocity on the line is that is tangent to the path of the particle um, and in the direction of the motion. So let's go back to this graph here. And this is hilarious. Huh? All right. So, average velocity here. What if that final velocity was a little bit closer? Then the average velocity would have been there. Or maybe just a little closer. Then the average velocity. See, what we're doing is letting the time interval get shorter and shorter and shorter. And ultimately, in the limit of this, the, the limit would then be the tangent line, because this is a secret line, that would be a secret line, that would be a secret line, that would be a secret line, but when you get down to just one point, your delta T is going to zero, that would give you the tangent line, and that's the line that just touches at that point right there, okay? That would be the tangent line. That's the instantaneous velocity at any time T. The direction of the instantaneous velocity is along the line that is tangent to the path and in the direction of the motion. The SI unit for both average velocity and instantaneous velocity, meters per second. Meters per second. Velocities, speeds, meters per second. And our lab will do centimeters per second because we're dealing with a much smaller uh, time interval and much smaller displacement. Everybody got this so far? Okay. Well, let's step it up another notch. Time rate of change of displacement, that's velocity. Time rate of change of velocity, that's acceleration. The rate at which the velocity changes. So this average acceleration would be the change of velocity over your change of time. Okay? The instantaneous acceleration, then you let that delta T, the change of time, get smaller, smaller, smaller. That would be the limit of the average acceleration as delta T approaches zero. SI unit here would be meters per second per second, or often written as meters per second squared. In the lab today, it will be centimeters per second squared. Okay? And we'll be using this very formula. The one that we used in the last chapter, because that's what the lab is covering, the last uh, chapter two, no, topic two, sorry about that. Any question here? Everybody got it? Okay. Now, so let's look at the unit summary. Displacement is measured in meters. 
position is measured immediate, displacement measured immediate, which is change of displacement. Uh, average velocity, instantaneous velocity, meters per second. Meters per second, average acceleration, instantaneous acceleration, meters per second. Again, in our lab today, we'll be using centimeters, centimeters per second, and centimeters per second squared. All right. All right, <clears throat> built a lot on what we did in, in, in topic two. There is a quick quiz, bottom of page 60. Which of the following objects can't be accelerated? Which of the following objects cannot be accelerated? A, an object moving with a constant speed. B, an object moving with a constant velocity. Or C, an object moving along a curve. Which of those cannot be accelerated? Object with a constant speed, object with a constant velocity, or object with a con uh, moving along a curve. Which of those cannot be accelerated? There's the definition of accelerating. Which of those objects could not be accelerated. Object with a constant speed. Second? Constant velocity would not be because it to be final would be the same as the initial if it's constant velocity. Speed it could be. Going around a curve at a constant speed, you're changing velocity because you're changing direction. But velocity, if that's constant, you're neither changing direction nor speed, so therefore you could not be accelerating. So that should be B. And I know somewhere in the back here they have it. Um, this is topic 3B, exactly. Okay, 3.2. Consider the following controls on an automobile. Gas pedal, brake, steering wheel. The controls on in this list that can cause an acceleration of the car are A, all three, B, only the gas pedal and the brake, C, only the brake, D, only the gas pedal. And this is Darius, right? I know you're in here somewhere. There you are. Okay. Again, quick quiz to bottom of page 60. Consider the following three controls in the automobile. Gas pedal, brake, steering wheel. The controls in that list, those three controls, that can ca cause an acceleration of the car are all three is A, B is gas pedal and brake, C is only the brake, D is only the gas pedal. What you think? Which of those cause an acceleration? can cause an acceleration. Second, B, which is the gas pedal and brake. They certainly do cause accelerations, but are those the only two? All three. A, all three. Why? Steering wheel changes direction. That changes velocity. Whether you change speed or not, velocity is direction and speed. So if you change direction, you're changing velocity. So it should be A. 3.2 is in the A. All right. And this is essence, right? Okay. There you are. All right. Now they do the slide that tells you that. Ways in which an object might accelerate. If the magnitude of velocity or the speed changes with time, certainly you're accelerating. <coughs> Positive for that speed going up. Negative is the speed going down. Okay? Well, not always, but pretty close. Direction of velocity may change with time. That changes the velocity. 
Oh, the velocity is the vector quantity. If its direction changes, even if the speed constant, then you have a change in velocity or an acceleration. Even if the magnitude was constant. Both magnitude and direction may change with time, and then certainly you're accelerating. Okay? So any one of those three, so that's why the accelerator, the brake, or the steering wheel, all three cause change of velocity, so therefore accelerate the car or vehicle. Okay. Before we get into projectile motion, there's one more quick quiz. A girl on a bicycle takes 15 seconds to ride halfway around a circular class of a circular track of radius 10 meters. Girl on a bicycle takes 15 seconds to ride halfway around a circular track of radius 10 meters. A. What is the girl's average speed? Okay, let me sort of draw a picture. Girl on a bicycle goes halfway around the circular track. The, it takes her 15 seconds. The delta T is 15.0 seconds. Okay, the radius of this track is 5, no, 10, Point zero meters. That's the radius. R, R. Any one of those R's is 10 meters. Okay? What is her average speed? Anybody? What would you have to calculate to get her average speed. How is speed defined? Distance divided by time. How far did she ride? A little louder? Okay, 10 meters. 10 meters was the radius. She rode on the path. If that's 10, don't you think this is a lot longer than 10? How long is it? Say again? Pi R. Pi R, you're absolutely right. Two pi R would be one time around. Halfway around would be pi R, which would be pi times 10. So that would be approximately, the distance she went would be approximately 331.4 meters. Right? 10. Point zero times three point one four one five blah 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 blah, but you only use need three digits, so it's about thirty one point four meters. Okay, that's how far she drove, road. How fast? What was her average speed? Say again. Yeah, it would be thirty one. The average speed. I'm going to put S. They don't like that, but I like to put it. Average speed is 30, is distance over time, which would be 31.4 meters divided by 15.0 seconds, and that would be just a little over two. Anyone give me a couple digits there? 2.09. What units? Meters per second. Very good. Okay. So there's the A part. What is the magnitude of her average velocity? Second? I still couldn't hear. Okay. That's the magnitude of her average velocity. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Now, what is average velocity? Change of displacement for change of time. Displacement, not distance. Distance is speed. Displacement is uh, where you are. Okay. Now, I know that you're in the air, Brian. Okay. 
Now, what was her initial displacement? Zero. Right here, we'll call that zero. What was the final displacement? Right here. Her initial position here, final position there. How far had she gone? 20 meters to the right, let's say. Uh, it doesn't give a, a unit here. Oh, it says what is the magnitude of her average velocity? Would be, that would be 20 meters, and it took her 15 seconds. So her average velocity would be 20 meters over 15 seconds, which would be, second. 1.3, approximately 1.33. Let's carry it because we have three significant digits. It should be a 20.0 and a 15.0. 1.33 meters per second. Do you see why those are different? It doesn't matter how far she went, it was what her displacement, change of displacement over change of time, in those um, 15 seconds, she went from here to here. That was just a total displacement of 20 meters. Her distance she traveled was a lot further. Yes? So if, okay, so if you have a significant digit like 3, so we have like 1.3 repeating, and like you rise at 1.3 like far. Do you know yeah, uh, that's fine. Yeah, that, can you do that like, if there's like 3 significant digits? Or? Yeah, well, a 1.3 with a bar over the 3 just indicates the 3s keep going. Yeah. Uh, I don't care if you write it that way, but just understand you don't can't get more than two significant digits out of that, even though your calculator has three, 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 three. So if you do something else with that number, you still have to round the three digits or whatever the significant digits were. Yeah, I I like to do that rather than if it was seven significant digits, I don't want to write one point three 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 three. Yeah, I just one point three. I'm lazy. Okay, you're not. I'm sure, but yeah. All right. Okay. Let's make sure they got it. Oh, and, yeah, and they just said magnitude. They didn't say direction. So 2.09 and 1.33. Excellent. All right, now I think we're ready for projectile motion. Okay? This will be the next lab. Okay? So I think we'll get far enough along today so that we can have the next lab on Monday. And by the way, folks, I want to make this a promise. I don't know if I can actually do it, but we will meet twice a week from now on. In the first four weeks, we've only met twice a week once. The uh, first week, we started on Wednesday, second week, we had a holiday on Monday. Third week, we were here both days, and last week, or this week, I was out. I thought we were change the meeting on me. Okay. So, projectile motion. An object may move in both the X and the Y directions simultaneously, okay? In other words, it's moving in two dimensions. <clears throat> in reality, things move in three dimensions, okay? We won't get there. Uh, we'll just stick with two. The form of the two-dimensional motion we will deal with is an important special case called projectile motion. <coughs> because even though things are moving in space, we're just going to assume that a initial velocity is along one line. And then just change your coordinates so this is your x and that's your y. Even though that may be your original x and this is your y, at any one time the velocity is only in one, uh, in one direction, but it has a horizontal and a vertical component. So we're going to consider that projective motion. Okay? And from now on, it's going to be written as if the plane of the board is that plane of, of motion, motion. Okay, here are some assumptions we'll make in projective motion. We may ignore air friction. Okay, is that fair? Not really, unless you're on the surface of the moon, Mercury, uh, some of the uh, moons of other planets. Not going, I mean, there's always some air resistance. But as long as the velocities are small enough, the speeds are small enough, basically you can usually ignore air resistance because you have to get up to pretty good speed before you really notice the 
air friction anyway. I mean, I don't notice much air friction there. There I can feel a lot more. Okay, so as long as the speed is relatively small, we can ignore that. We're also going to ignore the rotation of the Earth. If we throw a ball into the air, we're not worried that the Earth is spinning underneath it, so therefore there's three dimensions there. We're just going to assume it's going to go up and come down before the Earth moves very far at all. And that's a pretty safe assumption, too. If you're firing a rocket into the air, and it's going way up there, no, nah, you've got to uh, also count the rotation of the Earth. Does anyone know what... Uh, phenomenon that is called that when you have to take in the rotation of the earth that's called the Coriolis effect okay you always get a little bit of a uh, of, of a change from there does anyone know a ramification of the Coriolis effect have you ever pulled the stop around the sink of water what do you notice when the water goes down? It what? Swirls. It swirls. And if you ever notice, it always swirls in the same direction. Okay? That's the cause of the Coriolis effect. Believe it or not, that small change, there is. So, really, we probably should be taking that, but it's pretty small. Now, just to show how weird physicists can be, <clears throat> the professor I had in my first quarter, I believe it was, junior level physics course when I was at Georgia Tech, I was a physics major. Uh, he was a nice old guy. I had him for a couple of other courses, it seemed like. Um, when I got into his specific area, he got to be a lot more demanding of a teacher. But on the general thing, he was pretty... Uh, easy to deal with. Um, he was a pre preeminent crystallographer, studied crystals uh, and structures and stuff, and uh, and boy, he was, he was like editor of one of the main crystallography journals. So he was up there. And one year they had the big crystallography meeting, not in the northern hemisphere where they regularly did, they had it in Rio de Janeiro, um, that's in Brazil, yeah, in Brazil. Which, I don't know if any of you know anything about Rio, or have heard anything about it. It's kind of the party city of the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, they know how to have a good time down there. And Dr., goodness, can I remember his name now? It's long the two. Uh, but this professor was going to the meetings down there. He was editor of the journal. He was a honcho in the society. So he pretty much had to be there. He got to go to Rio. Okay. And he said he was so excited when he was going to Rio. And when they finally landed the plane at the long flight and stuff and got him to the, uh, to the hotel, he just said he could not wait. What do you imagine he couldn't wait what to do? Say again? No! Run to the restroom and flush the toilet! Why? Because it would have flowed and twirled in the opposite direction. And being the physicist, he knew that was supposed to happen. He wanted to see it for himself, and sure enough, he did. That shows how weird physicists are. Party city of the southern hemisphere, and he wanted to go flush the toilet. Okay, never mind. So, rotation of the Earth, Coriolis effect. Won't go there, except a little bit like that. With these assumptions, an object and projectile motion will follow a parabolic path. Will always follow a parabolic path. Now, what's true about a parabola? One note. Okay, what would the formula look like? Uh, always a quadratic. quadratic. A quadratic. A 
okay? Uh, which also means it's symmetric about an axis. And we call that axis, cleverly named, axis of symmetry, okay? Symmetric about it, so we call it axis of symmetry. Whatever is happening on this side, identically the same thing happening on the other side, just in the opposite direction, okay? So, that's what they mean by following a para parabolic path. If there was air resistance, it would be slowing down faster, yeah. There would be some things non-parabolic about it. If we had rotation of the Earth, yeah, you have some distortion that gets off the parabolic path. We're going to assume those are good, so we can use the parabolic assumption. So here are the rules for projectile motion. You have an x-coordinate, you have a y-coordinate. x-coordinate is parallel to the Earth's surface, y-coordinate is perpendicular, always. The x and y directions of motion are completely independent of each other. If the x is changing, that doesn't change the y. If the y is changing, that doesn't change the x. They're independent of each other, number one. Number two, the x direction is uniform motion. What do we mean by uniform motion? When we say motion, think velocity. Uniform velocity meaning velocity does not change. The velocity is constant. If the velocity is constant, the acceleration is zero in the x direction. Okay? Only in the x direction. The x direction is uniform motion. Uh, meaning uniform velocity, meaning it does not change, meaning acceleration in the x direction is zero. In the y direction, the object is always in free fall. Even if it's moving upward, we call that free fall, because then it's only under the influence of gravity and gravity alone. Once it's left your hand, left the bat, left the, you know, whatever, the racket, what, the, the, the golf club, once it's left, then it's in free fall. Your acceleration in the y direction is the acceleration due to gravity, which is always toward the center of the Earth, which is always in the negative direction, and we assume to be a constant g. Okay? There is another little assumption here. They didn't mention it before. If you're making this assumption here, that means you're position is never far from the Earth's surface. Now, that's not very well defined what is far from. Within a reasonable distance of the Earth's surface. Uh, you can't go many miles up and still be that degree. But just a few meters up, no sweat there. Okay. The initial velocity can be broken. In fact, it needs to be broken into an X component and a Y component. Why would that be necessary? Why don't you just use whatever that initial velocity is? Because the x component of that velocity never changes. The direction doesn't change, the magnitude doesn't change. How about the y component of that velocity? Always changing because it's always accelerating in that direction. In other words, if it starts off big here, in just a little while, it won't be as big. And then smaller, smaller, zero, and then negative, negative, negative. So the y component of the velocity is always changing. The x component of velocity never changes. Okay? So therefore, you need to break it into the two components. Now, here's another, here's how you break it into the two components. The zero here means original. I like to use I meaning initial. They like to use zero meaning ori uh, original. So that could be an O. I don't know if it's an O or a zero. I guess it's more of an O than a zero. Okay? So, the object has some initial velocity, original velocity. <clears throat> if that's an original velocity, it has a fixed length. That's the length of it, V sub zero. Okay? It has a fixed direction, that's your theta sub zero, okay? Now, magnitude V sub zero, uh, initial angle or, or direction would be theta sub zero. 
That fixes both the initial component in the x direction from your trig. If this is your initial velocity, okay, and this is your x direction, this is your angle, theta zero, then the x component of this, the angle here is the x component over the initial hypotenuse, okay, the initial velocity. So x is zero over this is cosine theta zero, so then the v sub zero x is v sub zero times cosine theta zero. So v sub y would be the sine component, the opposite component. This is the adjacent, that's the opposite. So this is your your initial component of your x velocity. This is the initial component of y velocity. This will never, ever, ever change in projectile motion. This will always change. <coughs> Becoming more negative. If it's initially positive, it will decrease that value until it goes negative and then continues getting more negative. If it's initially negative, it will just keep increasing the negative because it's always accelerating downhill. Does that make sense? Did y'all do this last time or you remember? Okay, so we're into new ground now. Okay. Here's the pictorial representation of what we just said. There's your initial position. Your initial, here's your initial position. There's your initial, excel, uh, initial velocity. Initial velocity is a fixed length, initial speed, at a fixed angle, theta sub zero. Okay? That's the only time it will ever be this. Ever. The only time it'll be that. Ever. But initially, that's where it started. Well, right then, find its component in the x direction and the component in the y direction. That would be this for the x, this for the y. Okay? This never changes. A little bit later, it's still that. 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 It does not change. The x component of your velocity does not change. And that component is v0, the magnitude of v0, times the cosine of this angle, theta 0, that gives you the magnitude of this. Always in the, uh, whatever that initial direction was. This component, the y component, always changes. A little bit later, it's gotten less. Why? Because the acceleration is negative in the y direction. Always negative. There it is. G is always downhill toward the center of the Earth. So this reduces. It reduces at some point to zero here. The, pos the position on that parabola where the velocity, the y velocity is zero, that's going to be the vertex of that parabola. That's going to be the place where your axis of symmetry passes. So everything that happens here is similar to here. Here is here. Except they're going in opposite directions. Okay, but your initial velocity in the x direction never changes, not even up there. Only the y component of that. Okay, that's the peak of the path. That can be determined right there. And then, after it went to zero, it was an initial y component here. That, by the way, you got from v0 times the sine of theta tau, theta zero. That gives you this component we've been drawing here, here, and here. But then, in a, just a short time, it's reduced, it's reduced, it's reduced, it's reduced until it goes to zero. Then it starts going negative and gets greater and greater negative until it lands or whatever. Now, I said this velocity never will repeat itself. The magnitude of the velocity will repeat itself at an identical elevation here. This magnitude equals that one, but they're just in op not quite opposite directions, but different directions. This magnitude will equal that one. It's just that this component never changes, this component exactly changes. So the y component is exactly opposite at an equal altitude, you might say, as what it was here. 
but the x doesn't change, maintains its direction and uh, magnitude to the x component. So that mu velocity is the same magnitude as this one, but in the opposite. In a different direction. Let me put it that way. Different direction. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, Let's look at projectile motion at various initial angles. And we're going to keep initial speeds the same too, but at changing just the initial angle. Now, y'all remember what complementary angles were? Oh, your hair's not. No, that's not what we meant. What do we mean by complementary angles? Anyone remember that from two? Okay, uh, not quite. 90, 90 yeah. <laughs> Supplementary equal 180. Uh, Complementary equal. Think of this, remember, that's not an I there. That's not telling them the hairs of knife or anything. That's an E there. Look at that, you almost see the word complete. They complete a right angle, perfect angle, the you know, strongest angle, okay? So it's the right angle that they have here, okay? The complementary values of the initial angle result in the same range. So you fire this off at just 15 degrees here. It doesn't have much vertical component, a fairly long horizontal component, but that vertical component decreases quickly and comes down and hits right here. At 30 degrees, you have a larger uh, Okay, can't be, can't be. Okay, has anyone else come in since I called roll that I might have been talking to the board and missed you? Okay. All right. At 30 degrees, with the same initial speed, but now a shorter horizontal component, but a larger vertical component, uh, it won't go, that shorter horizontal component continues, because the vertical component is larger, it takes more time for it to reach its maximum and come down, so it'll go way over there. 45, decrease the horizontal a little bit, but increase the vertical quite a bit, it's going to go over here. And by the way, maximum length, 45 degrees. This is assuming no air resistance and or any other influence. Okay, 60 degree angle, you've really reduced your horizontal component, but increased your vertical component, so therefore it's going to be up in the air longer by the time it slows, 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 goes to zero, and then increases again, but because its horizontal component is shorter, it doesn't go as far all that time, so 30 and 60 wind up at the same place. In other words, if they're complementary, values of initial angle, the range is the same. 75, really steep vertical component, but a very small horizontal component, so the vertical is decreasing slowly because it has such a large component here, reaches here, but because it has such a small horizontal component that didn't change, it's going to go way up and come right back down on uh, and land at the same place as 15 because those are complementary angles. Now, I didn't see a whole lot of the uh, uh, NBA playoffs. I don't know if any of y'all watched it, but uh, if you did, I bet you there was somebody that shot a ball very steep into the air to keep it from getting blocked. I didn't see it, but I know it usually happens. If they're penetrating a little short guy, he's gonna put it way up there and have it come down. Therefore, that kind of trajectory would be the same as if he was, uh, that tall guy was there and just shooting right toward the basket. He could do the same thing, and yet they hit the basket right in the same place. Approximately, I was just assuming the shot from the same height, which would be fair. Uh, whereas if you're trying to get the maximum range, you're going to try to shoot that thing as close to 45 as you can. You know, if there was a desperation shot at the end of the quarter, you know, you're shooting from a long way away, 
best angle is probably something for the side, so it's something pretty close to it to get the maximum range as possible. Okay? Same thing, golf, golfing, okay? If you have a very uh, uh, shallow um, angle here, okay, you're probably not going to go too far unless you hit it well into the air. Or hit it with a wedge or something like that, hit it way high, like a sand wedge, way high into the air, you're going to have a shallow range too. So those two ranges would be about the same. Maximum, you want it closer to 45. Okay? You want maximum distance, that's what you go closer to. Does that make sense? All right. So let's do a few details about these rules that we just went in. Okay? Summary here. In the x direction, in the x direction, the acceleration is always zero. Zero, the x component of your acceleration vector is zero because your only acceleration vector in free fall is straight down acceleration due to gravity alone, nothing else, so the x component is zero. Your v sub x, that's your velocity in the x direction, is always whatever its initial velocity was in the x direction because that never changes, and it's always v0 plus time theta 0. That's constant throughout the motion. Throughout the motion, that's always the same. Therefore, since you have constant velocity, this formula is always true. Your x component of your velocity is always whatever that initial component of the x velocity was times the time that you're in flight. Always. It doesn't change. The, the distance is always uh, whatever the x component velocity was. Multiply that by time. That gives you your x component. Very simple formula. That's the only operative equation in the x direction since there is uniform velocity in that direction. That's the only equation you ever have to know in the x direction. Or projection. Yeah, that's it, folks. Okay? Now, if I'm going through five too fast, slow me down. Okay? Everybody got it? Now, in the y direction, <laughs> not so simple. Okay? Your initial component in the y direction is fixed by that initial velocity, whatever it was, and the sign of that initial angle. That's fixed. But since it's a free fall problem, the only other thing that's fixed is your acceleration. The acceleration is minus g. They didn't give directions here because this is always minus g sub 1. The a in the y direction is the only acceleration you have, and that's minus g in the y direction. There is no x component of the acceleration. We saw that in the last slide. So this is a constant down. We call this uniform acceleration. Constant acceleration, constant in magnitude and it's constant in direction. Okay? Now, normally we take positive direction upward, that's why we make this a minus g pointing, meaning that it's always pointing towards the center of the earth, which is downward. This is uniformly accelerated motion. So the motion equations all hold, every one of those. They held for the uh, x direction too, it's only one of them is necessary because the acceleration in the, y in the x direction is zero, so any with acceleration in them, those components don't make any difference, okay? So these equations, the motion equations hold. All right, now, Let's look at the uh, okay. I have a couple of little things here and I I can't remember where they pop up in the the slides or if they popped up in the slides. If 
If they don't, I'll come back and mention them. I'll try to remember to them. Okay. So here are just a few features. The velocity of the projectile at any points in its motion is the vector sum of the x and y components of that point. Okay? And what can you tell me about the x and y components of velocity at any point? X component? Never changes. Once you determine it at the very beginning of the problem, it's that for throughout the problem. Always. Y component of velocity? Always change. Okay? Always change. But the velocity of the projectile at any point is the vector sum of the X and Y component. The X component that doesn't change and the Y component that's always changing. So therefore, the velocity is going to be changing. And because velocity is changing, not only is the magnitude changing, its direction is changing as well. And this direction is always the inverse tangent of the v sub y of the v sub x. So what can you tell them about v sub x? Never change. It's not zero, but it never changes. Whatever it was in the first of the problem, it will be that throughout. So you know that denominator always. Okay? If that was zero, you have no motion. Okay? Or you have straight up and straight down motion and no projection motion. Okay? Remember to be careful about the angles quadrant. Okay? Now what do they mean by that? Generally, you have, you'll take the horizontal component of the velocity to be positive. It doesn't have to be, but you'll assume that's positive. So, the vertical component, if it's positive, you're in the first quadrant. That vector is somewhere in the first quadrant. But if that velocity goes negative, which it will after the highest point, it may actually start negative, but it definitely goes negative after the, it reaches its peak. Then after that, you're always in the fourth quadrant. Okay? Now, if you think about inverse tangent, though, does anyone remember where the inverse tangent is defined? Minus pi halves to pi halves. Not inclusive, not counting those because it's infinite, both of those, but it's there. So basically, this will give you an angle that's in the fourth quadrant, and that generally is going to be where it is. If you had a weird problem that got you firing in a different direction, then you have to, to get the correct answer, you may have to either add or subtract 180 from that answer, the answer you get there. So you have to keep in mind where you're going, where the, 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 the velocity is actually heading, and make sure you're in the right quadrant. Because an inverse tangent is always going to be between minus pi half and pi half. It can't give you anything else. Okay. I think we'll see some examples with that. So let's continue this summary. Okay. Provided that the air resistance is negligible, notice they really don't say zero. On the moon it would be zero, in a vacuum it would be zero, in space it would be zero. But as long as it's negligible, not too great, the horizontal component of velocity remains constant. Since a sub x is zero. Okay? We've said this about three or four different times. Hope you got it. The vertical component of the acceleration, of acceleration, not velocity, but acceleration, is constant. Equal in free fall to acceleration due to gravity alone. No other accelerations involved, so it's minus g, meaning in the negative y direction. The acceleration in the y direction is not zero. Okay. When you get to the peak, wherever that is, way up there, they reach that maximum height and start going down, 
What zero up there? Second? The x component is never zero. It's always constant, non zero. But the y component is zero. Y component of what? Okay, you may have been right. I should have asked this question. What x component were you talking about when you said x component is zero? A button. I was thinking vertically. I know, but component of what? Displacement, velocity, or acceleration? Okay. Probably not because it's been moving in this direction, so displacement probably isn't. But the x component of the acceleration is zero because all the way in free fall. It's only downward. So the x component of the acceleration would be zero. So if you're mini acceleration, your first step is right. When I was asking what's zero at the top, what is zero at the top? X component of acceleration tells us always zero. Yes. The y component of the velocity is zero because it's no longer going up. That's why it's at the top. Has it started coming down? That's why it's still at the top. So the y component of the velocity is zero at the peak. How about the y component of the acceleration? Is it zero up there? No, because the acceleration in the y direction is always negative g, constant, always negative g. It never goes to zero. You'd have to be in deep space for it to go to zero. We're not going to go that far, okay? So the vertical component of the acceleration is equal to always negative g. That means the acceleration in the y direction is never zero. It's always negative g. And at the top, it's the vertical, uh, the velocity in the y direction is zero at the top of the projectors direct, uh, tra trajectory. Okay, continuing. The vertical component of the velocity v sub y and the displacement in the y direction are identical to those of a freely falling body. So even though you've got it going at an angle here, following a parabolic path, the vertical component is acting just like it was a ball you thrown straight up and coming straight down. That dimension never changes. The vertical, the horizontal doesn't change either. It's always as if you're just moving in that direction at a constant speed. The projectile motion can be described as the superposition of these two independent motions, the x motion that's always constant, and the y uh, displacement that is free fall, going up and down only with the acceleration being constant. Now, What they left off here, and I find it a little disconcerting because they're pretty important. Okay. They said this early, and it stayed with them. Uh, This is the only operative equation in the x direction, okay? Because what were your other um, kinematic equations? One read something like this. V sub x is equal to uh, V sub 0 x plus A sub x t, okay? A sub x is always 0, so that means you're back to this again. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's not the same. It, this isn't the same as that. This is the same as this one. Sorry about that. That's the same as that one. Okay. What's your next one? Delta X is equal to V0 XT plus one half A sub X T squared. That was your second kinematic equation. But since this is always zero, 
this one is exactly this equation. Don't even need the delta there. Your x is always, if you assume the initial position was zero, then that would work. Your third kinematic equation was this one. V sub x squared is equal to V sub zero x squared plus two A sub x delta x. This is zero, okay? A sub x is always zero, meaning your final velocity in the x direction is always the same as your initial velocity in the x direction every place along the path. That was, again, the constant, always, okay? So all those equations coalesce to the same thing, okay? Now, over here, it said uniformly accelerated motion in the y direction, so all the motion equations hold. And here they are again, and this is what I wish they'd have written for you. V sub y is equal to V sub zero y, which that's fixed, that's a constant, plus A sub y, that's fixed, that's a constant, times T. So this does change, even though these two things are constant, the time is changing. As long as that time is changing, this is changing. <coughs> okay? The second one was your delta y is equal to uh, v sub 0 x t plus 1 half a sub y t squared. Okay? Sorry, my head is clogging up for some reason. This is minus g, always. So therefore, you can change this to minus one half g t squared, always. Okay. And whatever this was, that's a y there. It's not an x. Sorry about that. Uh, ah. Why is the eraser not working? There it is. Okay. V sub zero y is a fixed number. It doesn't change. The V sub y does change. This one doesn't change. Okay. I just wrote the wrong number down. And then the last one, V sub y squared is equal to V sub zero y squared plus two A sub y delta t. Okay? What about that? This is always minus g. That never changes for vertical motion. That's always negative g. So therefore, this is always changing by that. So no matter what your initial velocity was, you're going to be subtracting from that t times g times the time interval. So it's always making this a less positive number, a more negative number, okay, from what it was to begin with. Okay. All right. There's a couple quick quizzes. Let's see what we can do with them. 3.4. Suppose you're carrying a ball and running at a constant velocity on level ground, you wish to throw the ball and catch it as, as it comes back down. Neglecting air resistance, should you A, throw the ball at an angle of about 45 degrees above the horizon and maintain your same speed? Number two, should you throw the ball straight up in the air, slow down to catch it? Or should you throw the ball straight up in the air and maintain the same speed? What's your reference? You're running, carrying a ball at a constant velocity on level ground. You wish to throw the ball and catch it as it comes back down. Neglecting air resistance should you 
throw the ball at an angle of about 45 degrees above the her, her horizontal uh, and maintain your same speed. Throw the ball straight up in the air and slow down to catch it or throw the ball straight up in the air and maintain your same speed. What's your record? <clears throat> Say again? A, you said? Okay, A was uh, throw the ball at an angle about 45 degrees above the horizontal and maintain your same speed. Okay? Here's the problem with that picture, Houston. If you're going the same speed, and as you're going the same speed, you throw the ball with an additional speed, and you maintain your same speed, you're never going to catch it. Because it's going to have whatever, if you did 45, then uh, V0, that speed you gave the ball, plus your speed that you were running, uh, that speed you gave the ball times the cosine of 45 is going to be an additional velocity here. You're never going to catch it. Because you're just getting a greater velocity, you keep running the same speed, leaving you in the dirt. Everything is in the dirt on the other side. So no, A won't work. Throw the ball straight up in the air, slow down, and wait for it to come back. Now here's the problem with that. You, you're running at a speed, you throw the ball straight up, you still got the velocity in this direction, right? So you throw it up, even though you throw it straight up, you still got the velocity, it still has the velocity in that direction. If you slow down, it's still got the velocity there, it's going to come down, and you won't get it. So actually, you throw it straight up in the air, maintain your velocity, and it'll come back down. This is ignoring air resistance. With air resistance, yeah, you have to slow down a little. So the problem said ignoring, so this should be C, okay? If you're ignoring air resistance. Okay, so 3.4, let's see what they say. 3.4 C, that means yes in Spanish, okay. 3.5, as a projectile moves along its parabolic path, where the velocity and acceleration vectors, where are the velocity and acceleration vectors perpendicular to each other? As the projectile motion is moving in its parabolic path, where are the velocity and acceleration vectors uh, perpendicular to each other? A, okay, let me get your name please. Huh? Oh, got it, F-A, right at the beginning, sorry about that, I need you, okay. We're on page 64, topic three, uh, quick quiz 3.5 as a projectile moves in its parabolic path where are the velocity and acceleration vectors perpendicular to each other A. Everywhere along the parabolic the projectile's path B. At the peak of the path C. Nowhere along this path and D. Not enough information is given where are the velocity and acceleration vectors perpendicular to each other? Everywhere along the path, at the peak of the path, nowhere along the path, or not enough information is given. Any guesses? Okay. I'm going to tell you something about number one. Everywhere along the projectile's path, if velocity and acceleration were perpendicular, that would not be a parabolic path, that would be a circular path. Because in a circle, velocity is always tangent to the circle, and at constant speed in a circle, the acceleration is always centripetal. So that would be a circular path that could not be a parabolic path. So A is out. B, at the peak of the path, C, nowhere along the path, D, not enough information is given. I've ruled out A. 
because that would be circular motion, not parabolic motion. Anyone want to make a guess? At the peak, uh, nowhere along the path and not enough information to get. By the way, folks, you know this one. What can you tell me about the peak? What is the velocity of the projectile at the peak of the path? What can you tell me about the velocity? Second way to ask this question. What can you tell us about the vertical velocity here? Second? It's zero because it's no longer going up. It's not going down yet. This vertical velocity is zero. So therefore, what can you tell me about the other velocity there? Horizontal component only because that never changes. So at the peak of this path, this part is velocity only component of this velocity, so the velocity is horizontal. Okay, how about acceleration? Anywhere along the path, where is the acceleration? Toward the center of the earth. Meaning only a Y component. So only at the peak is the velocity is horizontal and it's acceleration vertical. Down there. That's the only place it will have to be perpendicular. Does that make sense? So I suggest at the peak of its path, 3.5 B. Yes. Okay. Now, problem solving strategy. How do we go about solving problems that deal with? Projection motion. Select the coordinates. Okay? How do we do this? We get one horizontal, that's going to be easy. Vertical, this way, you pick it out so that the projectile fits nicely in that system. Catch the path of the projectile. You can do it ahead of time. Just get you a nice parabolic curve. Now, what are some of the keys? Initial position. That initial position. Find out where that is. Remember we had a problem that you started at the top of the building. If that's where you're stop starting, then you know your initial displacement is somewhere up there. Okay? But pick that initial position. That initial position, whatever the initial velocity is, that fixes the x component that never changes, and it fixes the initial y component that is always going to change. Okay? What else never changes? In projection motion. X component of velocity never changes. What else never changes? I, I heard something, but I couldn't make it out. What was it? Someone said something. Help me. Vertical component of the acceleration. It's in free fall. The, the y component of the acceleration is always negative g. Always. Okay? So always put that in your picture. Somewhere put the y component of acceleration is minus g downward. X component of the acceleration, zero. Always. In free fall. Okay? In projectile motion. If you have rocket assistance, no. That's a different problem. Okay. So you include the initial and final positions, the velocities, initial and final velocities. If you know final velocity, your initial A. Accelerations are easy. Minus G in the Y direction, period. Okay? Next thing you do is resolve the initial velocity into its X and Y components. Why? Whatever that initial velocity was, why do you want to resolve that into x and y components? Tell me something about the x component. 
Okay, that's how many times have we said it? X component of velocity never changes. It's not zero, it never changes. X component of acceleration is zero, but not the velocity. So once you resolve that initial velocity and the X and the Y component, X component is that for the rest of the problem. Never changes. Y components always don't change. Tells the Y component of the acceleration is a constant. That's always going to change the Y component of the velocity. Treat the horizontal and vertical motion completely separately. Complete them separately. If you do do them at the same time, then later want to resolve the vector from there, then recombine them. But treat them all along the way completely independently of each other. Follow the techniques for solving problems with constant velocity in the x direction, that's always going to be the case, to analyze the horizontal motion of the axle. Follow the techniques of solving problems with constant acceleration, minus g, in the y direction, to analyze the vertical motion of the axle. It's going to be the same as free fall. It's throwing the object straight up into the air and letting it come straight back down. That's what it's always going to follow in the y direction. The x direction is just going to be a constant piece of x. Okay? Now, some variations of projectile motion. The object may be fired horizontally, meaning, say this plane is in level flight, uh, these backpackers are stranded on the mountain, and it's trying to drop some supplies to them. It's not going to bomb them. It's going to try to drop some supplies to it. Level flight, when it releases those supplies, the only component of motion that it has is in the horizontal x component, velocity. And that never changes throughout the problem. So if you know where this is now, you can calculate, if you know how long it takes it to hit the ground, you can calculate exactly the x position of that uh, landing. Okay. This has an initial displacement upward, so its vertical displacement is not zero. This is zero down here, which would be plus 100. The initial velocity, 40 meters per second, in the horizontal direction, that's never going to change. Always stays the same. Vertical, initially, is zero, so that's always going to change, accelerated by the acceleration due to gravity. Always go draw in the acceleration in the y direction is always the minus g. Always. Okay, draw that in. And then you can figure out the rest of it. So if it's fired horizontally, all that means is there's no initial component of the velocity in the y direction, but the only component of the acceleration in the y direction is in the negative g, so it's going to be downward. That 40 meters per second in the velocity in the x direction never going to change. The initial velocity is in the x direction. Uh, v sub 0 is v sub x. V sub x never changes. V sub y, I should say v sub y 0 is 0. That's an error here. Don't say v sub y is 0. That's always changes, but v sub y0, that 0. And all the general rules for motion apply. Okay? Now, this is what they call non-symmetric projectile motion. It's still a parabola, but you're standing on top of a 45 meter building when you initially make your initial velocity. Okay, that initial velocity was 20 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees. Now what's fixed and what's changing here? At that angle, at that initial velocity, your initial x component is fixed, your initial y component is fixed. And you know what they are, theoretically. What would they be? Thirty degrees. Anyone know the sine of thirty degrees? Never mind. Easy tech trick from. Okay, they don't want to hear from. Ryan, know who you take trick from? 
what's what's the sign of 30 degrees? Come on, folks, please. You can use your calculator, it's fine. Surprising number? I'm sure you're in degree mode. Sign of 30 degrees is? Point 0.5, one half, exactly. The sign of 30 degrees is one half. Okay, with that in mind, does anyone remember what cosine of 30 degrees is? You won't recognize it on the calculator, it'll give you a definite number. Square root of 3 over 2. Okay? I don't know if you remember the little. At zero degrees, your your y component here is zero. Okay, whatever your 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 total wise y component is zero. At thirty degrees, it's one half. Okay, one half your hypotenuse. Forty five degrees is square root of two over two. At sixty degrees, it's square root of three over two, and at ninety degrees, it's one. Okay. Those are basically your your signs of the angle, and you, this is zero. The square root of zero over two. This is the square root of one over two. This is the square root of two over two. Square root of three over two, and the square root of four over two. Because square root of four is two. Two over two is one. So if you just remember that, this is the zero, thirty, forty-five, sixty, ninety. So. 0 over 2, square root 1 over 2, square root 2 over 2, square root 3 over 2, square root 4 over 2. Y components. Okay? So, your Y component, which would be your V sub Y, would be 10 meters per second. Exactly half of what your V sub 0 is. Your X component would be the square root of 3 over T times 20 would be a little bit less than 20. Okay. Now, that horizontal component? Oh, we, uh, oh yeah, this is fine. Oh, Chuck. Okay, let's just finish this slide quickly. Follow the general rule for, okay, break the Y component, the Y direction into parts, up and down, symmetrical, back to the initial height, and then the rest of the time, you just have to be non-symmetrical. Now, in reality, it's acting as if it was fired from here and went up there and just happened to have that velocity when it got there, and that formed the parabola that way, but it never happened over here. So the parabola is still a symmetrical parabola. Okay? So we'll pick up and go from there. Now, actually, 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 let's go back to this. Let's pick up from here. There's example 3.2 right there. Let's do example 3.2. We'll pick up and do that starting next time, okay? And then this, the next one is example 3.5. So we'll do that next. And then we'll continue from there. We don't have a whole lot more. I mean, there is some things, but not a whole lot more. We should finish that within our first hour and 30 minutes next time. And then we'll be ready for the second lab. So what we'll do now is have a short break because I need to get the equipment up and uh, in place. So if you want to just stand and stretch, you can. Use the restroom. Go down and pick up. You know, something to eat or drink or something, but try to keep it. Remember, we technically have 10 minutes between. Try to keep it within those 10 minutes. Okay? So, what I'm going to do is pause. At 4 o'clock, I have to call roll again, so remind me of that. Okay? Um, all right, all of you have a copy of the lab. Is that right? Okay.
Now we've got, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. I think it's probably just 18. Okay, so we'll need six on per table. We only have five here, so one more join this group. One more join that group. And y'all got six already. So yeah, so one of them join each of these two groups. Okay. Now, first thing we've got to do, we got three teams, but I only got two sets of scales. Sorry about that. But you got three balls, one on each table somewhere here. You'll see a ping pong ball, it doesn't have to be orange, but a ping pong ball, plastic ball, a rubber ball, and a metal ball. So, each of you, I'm taking time, it's not going to, we don't have a, a, a big rush here, we got plenty of time. What you need to do is determine the mass of the ball on these scales. Okay, someone hand me one of the balls. Okay, now, uh, I was just going to demonstrate this in our... Uh, I'm demonstrating this work. If you use a weighing pen, you zero the scale with the pen on it. So then when you put the ball here, what you register is only the mass of the ball. Now on this, every little bitty braid on there is one gram. Okay? The longer every other one is a little bit longer, those are the even number of grams. And then um, the, bit, the ones with numbers are every 10 grams. So 10, 20, 30. So determine the mass of the ball. If you can get it to stay on here without the weighing pen, then you have to zero it before, without the weighing pen. So you choose how you're going to do it. Get your mass measurements as quickly as you can. I would say the same person who zeroes it should read the scale because you know where you were looking when you zeroed it, you read the scale. Okay? So all three teams get the masses of your three balls, record them here. And you can record these in grams. Record them in grams. There's another scale there. Another team could be using the second scale. Hint, hint. Another team could be using the second scale. Good deal. Okay. Oh, okay. Did you just get here? Okay, what's your name? Okay, Bria. And you just made it in by the skin of your teeth, okay? Into the first half. Okay. Oh, and you just got here too. Okay. And you are Raven, right? Mm -hmm. There you are. Okay. So two teams will now have seven and two people will have six. Sorry, we're so crowded. What's that? Sure. Okay, I'll get those in a bit, okay? All right. Okay. Now, while you're waiting to get to a scale, you can move along and do the B part on number one, and that's the length. So which team has still not done your match? Okay? There is a scale open. Wait, no, they need the scale. That's fine. All right.
reason. Your initial position was five, and then you're carrying this to your long edge down Okay. All right. If A, I saw her somewhere, but which team are you? There you are. Okay. Still here. Nick is still here. Tierra, I saw somewhere. Which team are you in, Tierra? Oh, did Tierra have to leave? She did, didn't she? Oh, no, Tierra's still here. Okay. I know somebody left. Courtney's still here. Raven came in. Shakina came in. She's still here. Charity hasn't made it in, right? The other Courtney, K is still here. Which team are you in? Courtney with a K. Oh, there you are. I see you. Okay. Ambry just came in recently, I know. Essence is still here. Ryan's kind of here. Larius is still here. Monique. Yeah, okay, good deal. Sasha? Okay. Allison? Okay. Okay, I hear some balls rolling, so let me stop before you. I'll get back to the roll. Okay. Is everybody now measured your masses? Okay, you set your scale at, I mean, your inclined plane at 5 degrees, and it's the lower part, uh, the lower part, is that 5? Okay, all right, now, every team has a stopwatch, and one of the teams let me borrow it just a total, second. Okay, here's the stopwatch. Okay, point out to you something about the stopwatch. There's a button at, say, 1 or 2 o'clock, and there's another button over here at 10 or 11 o'clock. This is your start stop at 1. Start, stop. Read that. That happened to be 1.65 seconds. The big one is the number of seconds, and 0.65, the decimal, or the slightly smaller. Okay, reset is over here at 10 o'clock. Press that, it goes back to zero. Now, how are you going to take these measurements? Here's my suggestion. These measurements will go on this page here with the chart on it. So I would say take your measurements somewhere on this page because what I want you to do is take each ball, each massive ball, and do three runs with it. Start, stop, stop. Okay. When it does something like that, you're going to have to redo the run because, uh, and I would say the same person who is operating the stopwatch is the one dropping the ball. So put it on the tabletop. Okay. No, right? No. In the group. In the group. In the group. Right there. Okay. When you release it, that's when you start to stop, and you stop it when it touches at the bottom. You'll hear that. Okay. So that happened to be 1.75 seconds, okay? These aren't reasonable numbers, okay? Are not reasonable numbers, okay? But that's two measurements. Then you clear it and do a third one. Start, stop. That was 2.09 seconds. Now, if you think those are close enough, you can live with them. If one of those seems a little far out, off from the other two, redo that one. Get three measurements that are relatively close to each other. 
Then what do you do? Throw out the height, and that's why you write them on the back of this page or wherever you want to. And then you may only have one person reporting, that's up to the team. But throw out the high and the low, take the middle. It's a little bit easier than doing average. Okay, average you have to add them up and divide by three. This will give you close enough. Okay, so you do that for each ball at each elevation. So clear that, then go to the second ball, the rubber or the you know, metal, whatever. Do the three, uh, three rolls for each ball, each elevation, throw out the high and the low. Now, if one of them's really off, like the stoplight didn't start or stop on time, redo that one, okay? Oh, you got some wrong with that. Okay? And throw out high and low. The middle value, that's what you put here, under time, okay? Once you throw out high and low, put the time, and that would be in seconds. Yes, sir. Right. Right. I saw that in the test, but I didn't want to take a shot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be asking you. Okay. Did you put the appendix in? No, I didn't. You didn't. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll give it right back to you. Okay. I also put some tutorials up there. Some what? Okay. When you switch it back, those will come transfer over. Okay. Okay. I just lost my pen. Did anyone? Is that here? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Cleverly disguised. Okay. All right. I have that Shakina was here on Monday. That Sasha was here on Monday. That Ryan was here on Monday, and the Essence was here on Monday. Is that the only five that were here on Monday? Anyone else here on Monday? I did not call your name. Okay, I'll return this to him. Okay. Any questions on how you do your time measurements? Everybody got your masses? Everybody got your distance? Okay, then start on your time. Now make sure your your thing is level. Yeah, you're on the table. I want to make sure that was off the edge. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. So enter in the room. I'm going to be I'm gonna turn off the uh, recording. When Dr. Bryant was just in here, he said he put some tutorials because I had his name added to the class when I was out on Monday. Uh, so he put the tutorials out there. You're certainly welcome to use those if you desire. They're on Blackboard. All right, I understand that at least some teams have finished doing all the time measurements, all three balls at all six angles, right? You took three measurements of each of each and threw out high and low and got the middle. Okay. <clears throat> now, if some of you are still taking measurements, you can, but just for a brief pause here, you got your times. How do we get average speed? What is average speed? Anyone tell me. This is over time. The average speed, I'll do V bar, is equal to distance over time. What distance are you traveling there? Okay, if you turn back to the front page, when you took that measurement of the length, that's your distance. Your first column here is your time. That will give you average speed for each ball at each elevation. So take your distance that you measured, page one, number B. That will be in centimeters. Divide it by the seconds you just determined, and that will give you your average speed for that ball at that elevation. Everybody understand that? So all of you should be filling out your forms. Yeah. No, no. Keep it centimeters per second. We're using such small unit numbers here. Let's just leave it centimeters per second. Okay. Any questions on that? There were some assumptions made. 
And one of these was that we were using uniform acceleration. What does that mean? Another word for uniform. Constant acceleration. And guess what? The ball rolling down the track under constant acceleration. Acceleration due to gravity. I hope none of you are throwing it down the track, right? You're releasing from rest, right? So constant acceleration. There is, when you have constant acceleration, if you know two speeds, then you can do this. Let's see, V1 plus V2 divided by 2 would be average speed, wouldn't it? Yay or nay? If it's constant acceleration, you can just take the average, so it's like you do grades, right? Okay? Now, since you know average speed, that's this one, the next question is, do you know your initial speed? Zero. You released it from rest. You didn't throw it down the thing, so you know your initial speed is zero. Well, you know two. So this is your final speed, okay? And you can get that by final speed is equal to twice the average speed, right? Multiply both sides by two, your initial is zero, so that's how you get your final speed. Just double the average speed you just took, okay? You just calculate. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Tell me how to do average acceleration, then. What is average acceleration? Okay, average acceleration is change of velocity over change of time. Okay, what was your final speed? You just calculated. What was your initial speed? This is V final minus V initial. What was your initial speed? Zero. So it's just V, and then the change of time, that was your time interval, you measured. So that time in column two, so it's your last column, final speed, divided by your first column, time. That's your average acceleration. And by the way, time, that first column that you filled in. By the way, did you answer E on the first page? Okay, good. Before you turn it in, be sure you answer G on the first page as well.